lots and lots of hype around, as you all know, um, lots of media attention. I think it's starting to switch a little bit to be a little bit more realistic now. But um, I just wanted to show you these few things because they're, um, we had a really different attitude to amphetamines um, in the past. They were a pharmaceutical drug. Um, this is an amphetamine inhaler, so it's used like a Ventolin inhaler um, from a, sometime around the 30s and 40s. Um, so this is from Pan Am. Some of you may remember Pan Am in the old days. This is from 1948 and um, I've just circled here. You can see um, you can get benzodrine inhalers off the little trolley, which is hilarious. And the funniest thing for me, this is hilarious, you have to pay for the alcohol, but the amphetamine's free. <laughs> awesome. And it was marketed really heavily all the way through the 30s into the 60s um, as a cure for just about everything. So um, if you can't read this, it says, Doctor, I'm tired all the time. Even the thought of beginning a day's housework makes me tired. That makes me tired too. <laughs> um, it's it, you know, marketed for... Uh, depression, anxiety. Um, this woman is pregnant. It was marketed as a, um, a morning sickness cure uh, and as um, an obesity um, overweight uh, treatment. What happened was in the 1970s, the US and then the UN um, made amphetamines a controlled substance because we were seeing a lot of people starting to abuse the drug, um, the pharmaceutical drug, and um, become dependent on it. So they're really worried about that. They made it illegal to, um, to purchase except under very specific circumstances. And then we got a great um, black market in it. Um, and that's when we started to see real problems happening. So let's just have a look at um, what amphetamines are. So we've got um, this group of drugs that are called amphetamines that are made up of different types of amphetamine. And nearly all of the amphetamines that we see in Australia, aside from some very limited diversion from pharmaceuticals, uh, is methamphetamine. And methamphetamine is the stronger of the two of, out of amphetamine or methamphetamine. And it's the more toxic as well. So from about the 1990s, early 19, sorry, the late 1990s, we started to see a switch in Australia from the manufacture and use of amphetamine, levoamphetamine, um, to methamphetamine, and then we started to see more problems occurring because of that. So methamphetamine it comes in lots of different types, lots of different kind of um, formulations, but the three main ones that we see on the street are what we on the street called speed, um, which is usually in powder, sometimes pressed into pills. Uh, base, which is a kind of sticky um, substance, and ice, which is causing all the the uh, attention at the moment. Now they're all the same drug. the The difference is that ice has um, undergone an extra level of refinement, so it's more pure. And base is the in-between um, trying to convert speed or um, amphetamine oil into crystal meth. Um, it's a, a mistake on the way to that process. So there's not very much of that around anymore. So what we've seen um, in the last National Drug Household, Household Survey, which was conducted in uh, 2013, and the results were released just last year, is um, a switch in the way people have been using um, methamphetamine. So prior to this survey, um, it's the only population survey data that we have, so um, we do rely on it. Um, prior to this, we saw most um, people preferred to use the powdered or pill version, which is the lower grade, lower purity version. But now we're seeing um, at least half of users preferring to use ice. So they've switched from about 22% of people saying they like to use ice to 50% of people using ice. So you can imagine um, ice is much more potent. Uh, it's about three to four times more pure than uh, the powder. So we're going to see at least three to four times more problems associated with it. <laughs> 
just to demonstrate this, this is the purity uh, levels of um, seizures that the Australian Crime Commission have put out and you can see from uh, around 2009 to 10, um, the purity started to increase of, um, across Australia in all jurisdictions. Um, and so by now, now that it's like four times the purity it used to be. Um, so what we've seen, is so one of the inaccuracies that's been bandied around is that we're having a, an, an ice epidemic. And what we know from the population level data is that about 2% of the population use some type of amphetamine or methamphetamine. And um, we know from that data and other data that about half of those people prefer ice. So we're talking about 1% of the population using ice. Even though that's doubled, it's gone from half a percent to 1%. So we're not talking epidemic levels, but there is a problem and I'm going to tell you what that problem is. It's not, it's not a problem of uptake, it's not a problem of multi new people using, it's a problem of existing users using in more dangerous ways. So what's happened is that there's been an increase in ice use, there's also been an increase in the purity of both speed and ice, so both of those have been increasing substantially. Um, now there's also a smaller price difference between speed and ice, so um, it's much more economical, if you like, to buy ice than it is to buy speed. So why wouldn't you, you know, if you were investing in a drug, um, you'd probably go for ice because you can get more for your money. And there's been um, a large increase in the number of people who are using weekly or daily. And we know, we're not sure about the dependence um, potential of methamphetamine, but we think if you're using two, three, four times a week, then you're at very high risk of being dependent. So we're talking about um, people moving from lower level use into um, potentially dependent using, uh, dependence uh, use levels. So I think what we're seeing with all this media attention is not the number of people increasing their use, but um, an increase in existing users of harms and dangerous ways of using. And that's really important because it tells us that we don't, we probably don't need to put so much effort into prevention, that's going okay. Whatever we're doing around prevention and reducing uptake is fine. But what we do need to do is to think about how we um, respond to people who are already using through secondary prevention and tertiary interventions. And that's where drug and alcohol services come in, mental health services and also primary care. So we've kind of got these two types of users, I think. I kind of break them into two. There's probably broadly three, but two types of users. The occasional user who uses once a month, and about 70% of users use fairly occasionally, so less than once a month. Right? So those people um, are going to require more harm reduction because they're at risk of acute um, responses when they're using. But 30% of people um, are more regular users, so they're using at least once a month um, up to every day. Uh, about half of those are using once a week, so about 15% are using once a week. So we think that on, um, on, on balance that probably about somewhere between 10 and 15% of regular users or users of methamphetamine are dependent on the drug. That's quite a different story to it being the most addictive substance we've ever seen in our entire history. Um, heroin, for example, has a much higher dependence propensity than um, methamphetamine. Methamphetamine probably has about the same dependence propensity as cannabis, for example. More than, more than alcohol, less than heroin or um, tobacco. So who's using? You can see here the red line is uh, 20 to 29 year old age group. So they are historically and currently by far the heaviest users, um, three times as much as everybody else on average. Um, but you can also see the green line, it's the 30 to 39 year old age group, and they um, have been slowly increasing their use. 
so there's a lot of those are probably um, you, you can see the you can see the dip in 20 to 29 year olds as the 30 to 39 year olds um, increase so it's probably the same cohort kind of aging and moving in but this is also important because it, historically we believe that people who use methamphetamine are quite young but actually they're getting a lot older and so if we're um, trying to identify or assess for someone uh, in particularly in non-specialist settings and we're only asking um, when we think they're at high risk we need to remember that um, the older users are also now a much higher risk. People who are unemployed or who say they can't work um, are about twice as likely to use methamphetamines as um, people who are employed. So among the unemployed, the rate is about double um, um, among the employed. But nearly 70% of users are still employed. So it's not a, it's not a group of um, hugely marginalised um, low socioeconomic um, patients. They're, they're people who are still employed, still engaged with their families, but are, are starting to have problems with their use. Uh, we also um, have data showing that people in remote and very remote areas, and this is um, where we're seeing a lot of uh, concern about remote Aboriginal communities and the increase in ice around um, those communities, they're also twice as likely to use methamphetamine and other drugs. But um, people in inner and outer regional areas are actually less likely to use um, methamphetamine, which is a different story to all our country areas that are being awash with um, methamphetamine. What I think is happening is that um, people who were using at fairly low levels previously who we wouldn't have even noticed because they're using just on the weekend and they're recovering fine, they're going back to work, no problem. You wouldn't, you probably wouldn't even know that they were users and now starting to use more frequently. They're using more potent um, and they're using at higher levels and so we're seeing problems and they're becoming more visible to us. And so we're seeing a visibility issue. Um, but 65% of users are still in capital cities again, so we're still, um, uh, the, the focus and concern is still around um, the metropolitan areas. These occasional users using less than once a month, um, they're much more likely, sorry, less likely to be dependent. Um, they're probably mostly swallowing and snorting, although there has been an increase in smoking among this group as well. Um, they tend to be working, they tend to be a little bit younger. They will present to primary care with, um, for example, um, sleep problems or anxiety or you know, feeling a bit jittery or fidgety, fairly mild mental health problems. But they're the ones that you, you, know, you kind of want to look out for. The regular users are much more visible, so they will be much more likely to be dependent. And if they're not dependent, they'll be experiencing quite significant problems, some mental health issues, physical health issues, they might have lost a lot of weight, um, they're you know, up until four in the morning and then can't stay awake during the day, that kind of thing. Um, and they engage in much more risky activities than um, the low level users, they're much more likely to drive while they're intoxicated, um, they're much more likely in the National Drug Household Survey, it asks all sorts of um, fascinating risk activities and one of them's swimming so they're much more likely to go swimming while they're intoxicated um, they're much more likely to go to work while they're intoxicated or hung over from um, meth so this they're, they're going to be um, very very visible and starting to see um, fairly significant problems with their use so for the most of them most of the, this group who are just occasional users we're really looking at um, secondary intervention, secondary prevention and harm reduction type interventions. Um, and the focus is to reduce harms and prevent um, moving on to higher levels of use and riskier use and more dangerous use. They don't need to go to a tertiary treatment centre, but they will present to primary care and some of them will be picked up in other services like mental health as well. The other group are much more likely to be referred to a uh, tertiary 
alcohol and drug service and um, that's where they should be because they will be um, at high risk, very high risk of harms, of long-term harms um, and many of them will be dependent and risky users and require some intervention for that use. So some of the um, effects that we see at low doses, and this is part of the problem with methamphetamine, is that at very low doses it's actually quite a good drug to use. And I'm not speaking from experience, just to be clear. Um, that people report um, feeling really good and having lots of energy and being able to think really clearly and feeling really alert and on top of things. and. Um, a lot of women take it for um, to reduce weight, so that because like, they don't feel like eating, and um, th and that's where people generally start using. And because the drug is actually um, a very nice drug to use, and it actually has some positive benefits, and that's why it was a pharmaceutical drug because it did have positive ben benefits. But then, when you start using higher doses. Um, we're looking at um, really problematic issues like aggressiveness and hostility, um, feeling quite nervous and anxious and having some fairly serious anxiety symptoms, um, some low level psychotic symptoms like uh, thinking someone's watching you or after you or hearing things or seeing things that aren't actually there, um, and a range of other physical problems that people might be experiencing as well. When we're looking for toxicity, um, it's, it starts to get fairly obvious that people will have difficulty breathing, um, there's a lot of uh, muscle issues, spasms, jerking, um, sometimes seizure, not very often, um, but they may uh, present as being very confused and disoriented um, and be um, very agitated and um, in a kind of panic state. And then there's this group of people who've been using for quite some time at fairly high levels and they're going to have some much more entrenched problems and the, the key issues that they will present with um, are things like poor concentration and memory. So you can see when you just use a little bit over a short period of time, it's really good for your memory and concentration, but after a while it starts to wear out those systems and um, concentration and memory is really poor, you get some psychotic symptoms from the increases in dopamine, um, heavily disturbed sleep, um, weight loss, sometimes chest pains. And, but the biggest thing that people report is just feeling like they couldn't be bothered doing anything. So really hard to get to work, um, hard to um, do daily activities, um, and, along with depression and anxiety. So I just want to, this is a brain, as you can see, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the effects of methamphetamine on the brain because it, um, I, don't, I don't subscribe to the addiction as a brain disease whatsoever. Um, but I do think understanding the effects particularly of methamphetamine on the brain because it's quite complex and a little bit different from other drugs can help us to understand if we see someone um, who has a methamphetamine problem or who presents um, with symptoms that we might suspect they might be using some meth. Um, it helps us to understand why um, they're presenting with these issues. The red bit is the frontal lobe and that's the more important bit and the blue bit is um, uh, the temporal lobe which contains the limbic system and they're the two really important um, pieces for methamphetamine. What meth does is, um, the primary action of meth is to increase the levels of dopamine um, significantly. Significantly doesn't even describe it. Some estimates from brain studies suggest 1200% over anything else. So that's a lot of dopamine floating around in your brain. Um, that's including other drugs, much, much higher than other drugs. And the dopamine pathways um, run through the frontal lobe and through the limbic system. In our daily life, in our, when a brain's functioning normally, um, the simplistic version is that um, something might happen to us in a context, the limbic system will throw up some memories about it, um, 
and some emotional content and the frontal lobe filters that so the frontal lobe says oh, do i need to get upset about that do i need to be happy about that and those two things need to work in conjunction with each other for our emotional system to work effectively um, what happens um, with meth users is that eventually over a long period of time those dopamine systems are so um, flooded with dopamine that that dopamine system stops working and it can't produce any more dopamine for a very long time. So therefore those two systems now are not talking to each other and that's why we get a lot of um, emotional um, untetheredness I guess, you know, just emotional um, reactions to things that wouldn't normally, shouldn't normally be um, uh, emotional. Okay, so what happens in the brain is, this is a normal brain. Um, something nice happens, you get a little squirt of dopamine, those little blue things are, are meant to be dopamine molecules. They go into the, between the two, into the synapse between the two um, ends of the neurons and sends the next message along. But what happens with methamphetamine is that um, not only does it release loads and loads of dopamine, so there's heaps kind of floating around, which you'll see in a second, the yellow things that are coming up are methamphetamine molecules. So it's the meth is kind of releasing loads and loads of dopamine and then it blocks the reuptake. So there's heaps and heaps of dopamine still floating around, not being able to be um, reuptaken. And therefore you use lots and lots of dopamine and that system just completely wears out and it can't produce any more dopamine. And this happens to everybody who uses a lot of meth, so if you're using high doses on a Friday or Saturday night, this is why um, it takes a couple of days to recover. So um, they might not feel that great on Sunday, Monday, maybe even into Tuesday because the dopamine systems are worn out over a short period. Um, but what happens with long-term meth users is those systems are worn out over a very long period of time and it takes months and months and months to recover, not days to recover. So dopamine is really important in our, for a whole range of functioning in our brain, um, but we do know that high levels of dopamine are linked to psychosis, that's why we see psychotic symptoms in people who are using high doses or over long periods of time. Um, as I said, it, wears out the brain and therefore you end up with a lot of craving for the drug and a motivation and feelings of depression. And it also regulates our thinking processes as I said. So then people start not making very good decisions, they're not really able to um, work towards goals, all of the higher order thinking um, processes are impaired. The other two systems that are affected by methamphetamine are noradrenaline and serotonin. Um, so the noradrenaline system, as you know, activates the fight or flight, controls the fight or flight system in our, in our brain. Um, and it also has impact in arousal, mood, concentration, attention, uh, learning and memory. So it has a very similar effect, it releases lots of noradrenaline, that system um, wears out as well. But while there's lots of noradrenaline around, noradrenaline around um, the fight or flight system is then activated all the time. So people on meth are on all the time, ready for something to happen. So methamphetamine doesn't um, increase aggressiveness in itself, it increases the threat potential, the threat um, threshold of people who are using. So they, um, as a result of the increases in dopamine, they may be a bit paranoid, and as, as a result of the increases in noradrenaline, they'll be um, in flight or fight mode, ready to for something to happen. And therefore, something small might happen, something we think is small, they will react to it in a, as if it's a, a high threat situation. Um, serotonin activates a whole range of systems, but particularly it, it has a, an effect in um, optimism, which is it's the main thing that gets activated in uh, when someone takes ecstasy, which is why everyone is beautiful and I love everybody and everything's fabulous when you take um, ecstasy because of this increase in serotonin. But when you don't have enough serotonin, so when that system wears out, 
then um, the effect is feeling flat and depressed, um, not unfocused and very negative and a, and a little bit edgy. So you can start to see, um, because of the effects in the brain, why, um, a meth why you see some of those high dose effects and some of those long term effects. We're looking at um, inability to regulate emotions because of these effects, planning, decision making, focus and attention or the frontal lobe um, uh, uh, functions are not working, impulse control and um, flexibility of thinking, memory, mood, a whole range of things get affected when someone's been using meth, even over a fairly short period of time, but particularly over a long period of time. So let me just ask you then a question, interactive talk today. What do you think, if you think about um, how meth affects the brain, what is going to happen when you see someone in front of you or when you've got a meth user that you're trying to respond to or treat? So getting to appointments is um, a big issue, but also if you're trying to um, provide treatment for someone with uh, who's a meth, who's meth dependent particularly, they might have trouble completing tasks. Now CBT is the best practice for meth use, um, but it requires a lot of engagement and a lot of homework, um, a lot of um, tasks to do at home, and sometimes that's quite difficult to get organised to do those kinds of tasks. Um, taking on new information is really difficult, so you might have to tell someone who's withdrawing or dependent on meth um, many times the same thing before they can um, embed that into their memory. So it's not just a, here's a bit of information, go away and think about it and come back. You may have to engage with them several times before they actually take that on board. And also, I think, not get frustrated that they're not taking it on board because they're not, it's not because they're not trying or they don't want to. Um, so thinking about consequences is affected, being able to set goals and work towards goals, and that's what we do, isn't it? We ask people what their goals are and um, help them work towards those goals, and that's often very difficult, even just thinking about what I want to do, but also moving towards those goals. And um, stopping inappropriate behaviour, so they know that, that they know they shouldn't be doing X, but it's hard not to do that anyway. So get a lot of impulsivity um, that is regrettable afterwards. We need to adjust how we respond to meth users because they're not going to be um, compliant with our current systems of, of treatment. Back to this kind of withdrawal issue, um, the green the green uh, line is a kind of typical, I guess a typical heroin alcohol type withdrawal. So five to seven days um, the drugs out of the system, referral onto um, longer term care is important, but essentially that's the end of withdrawal. So the blue line is um, meth withdrawal, and you can see for the first few days, absolutely nothing happens. Um, usually people just want to sleep and not do anything else. So when um, what we've discovered is when we put meth users into treatment, um, into, sorry, detox, on day one, they um, they are annoyed and they annoy everybody else because they won't go to group, they won't get up when they're meant to, they, they won't follow the structure because their brains are, are recovering and they just need to sleep for three days. And it's, that's not the start of withdrawal, it's more like a hangover period. So they need to just, their brains are just recovering from all of that meth use. Then about two or three days later, usually the withdrawal starts. The crash period, which is what that first few days is called, is um, also happens to light users as well. So they have a bit of a crash. They often have a bit of a crash as well, and then don't go into withdrawal if they're not dependent. So what happens with the acute withdrawal? You can see that it's much longer than for other drugs. It, it's about um, 10 to 14 days, so twice as long as um, for most other drugs. So that means if we're putting people, we're referring people into withdrawal, four or five to seven day withdrawal, that's not going to be enough. They're going to be leaving withdrawal still in active withdrawal. 
So we need to make sure that they can go to a place where they can have a longer withdrawal period, otherwise we're just setting them up for relapse instantly. Then after this 14 days, you can see up to 12 to 18 months later, there's this kind of, um, oops, sorry, um, there's a protracted withdrawal period that lasts for a very long time. So people are still feeling lots of craving, they may be still feeling um, a milder version of some of those acute withdrawal symptoms, and the relapse rate is very high in that 12 to 18 months as well. So um, what we do know, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is that uh, brief intervention is effective for methamphetamine users, but long-term follow-up is also important. So we can provide them with brief structured CBT motivational interviewing, for example, but um, if we just let them go after that, then they're likely to relapse. So we need um, some longer-term follow-up. That doesn't necessarily mean residential follow-up, but um, support uh, post um, the acute intervention stage. I was involved in this MATES studies, called MATES, and now someone asked me yesterday what that stands for. The M stands for methamphetamine, and I can't remember what anything else stands for. But it's a treatment, um, was a treatment outcome study that Rebecca McKeaton from NDARC at the time uh, was running. And um, what we found was that there was an 88% relapse rate from, um, particularly from residential rehab. The numbers look a little bit better from counselling, but we it was a small sample, so we didn't publish those, those numbers. Um, so this is a very high rate of relapse among drug users. Most, we would, most statistics would suggest that about 50% of people relapse in, um, in the first few months, um, but we're talking a lot higher than that for meth users. So this means that um, our general therapies that we use for um, other drug users may not be um, effective enough for meth users and we need to do something different. So the problem for us is that we don't have any um, medicine that's been approved for the treatment of either dependence or withdrawal, but there are a couple that show promise. So we did it. Um, that if you're interested, there's a review on um, the ANCD website, if it's still up. Now they've switched to Anacad. Um, a monograph that we uh, wrote um, where we did a systematic review of a range of medications, all the medications we could find. So the ones that show promise were dexamphetamine, um, modafinil, bupropion, naltrexone and methylphenidate. So those five showed more benefit than others, but really not, just not enough to be able to say, yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna be like um, buprenorphine or methadone for heroin. It's just not enough. And I was just gonna say there's not enough evidence. There's a lot of evidence and they're not effective. So I think um, there's a lot of studies, but they they're just not showing any outcomes. It is a bit of a problem because when we've done surveys before, meth users say that they want a pharmacotherapy and that would attract them into treatment, but we don't have anything really to offer them and all of these would be off-label prescribing if you were going to prescribe them. Um, we do have some psychological interventions that are effective, so referral for CBT particularly um, would be useful. Uh, so the first one is um, Amanda Baker, who many of you know, I'm sure, and I um, did a trial quite a few years ago now and published this manual that's uh, still available online on the National Drug Strategy House, not National Drug Strategy website. Um, it's a four-session intervention. We found that even two sessions of that four-session intervention was effective. So if you, even if you could do that or refer to someone to do that um, and then follow someone up, at least checking in on them and follow them up over the, a long period of time that would um, potentially enhance their outcomes. And this is a more recent one from South Australia. Uh, they compared the, um, everyone calls it the Baker and Lee intervention, it's a bit weird using my own name, but they compared it with ACT, um, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, and they found that they were both equally effective. So there's, there's two interventions that we could use, a brief ACT intervention and a brief CBT motivational interviewing intervention.
The other one is from the US from the Matrix program. It's really long and complicated, would be quite suitable for um, our residential rehab services that are much more long term, but it's intensive, multiple groups a week, one-to-one um, -one intervention, contingency management, urine testing, a whole range of things that don't really suit our, our patient services that well. I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of how services have changed the way they do things um, that have resulted in different, different outcomes for clients. So this is first um, a, a specialist clinic that I set up in uh, a turning point um, a, a few years ago. And um, we didn't do anything different, the treatment was the same, but we did have a psychiatrist and a GP as part of the treatment team, a nurse practitioner who was the case manager who did the follow-up and a psychologist who did the brief intervention. And, um, but the brief intervention, if you have a look at that brief intervention, it's exactly the same as we would do for any other drug users. It's relapse prevention. Um, but what we did differently was we marketed it differently. We said, there's a bunch of people here, four practitioners, they know what they're doing. Um, they've, they're specialists in, in uh, methamphetamine treatment, come into treatment. The brown um, data is uh, from the, nas uh, sorry, the national minimum data set at the time and you can see there's quite a bit of difference in who we're attracting in and their outcomes for treatment. So we got a lot more people who were employed, so much earlier intervention is what I'm going to um, take from that. Um, more people who were smoking, so and that's much more reflective of the population of users. About half are injecting, half are smoking, and um, a little bit older, but they stayed in treatment for a lot longer than um, than in the national minimum data set. And um, a lot more of them stayed for more than one session, and that's that's important given that we know about the protracted withdrawal period. The other one that I wanted to talk about was a step up, step down um, withdrawal service and I've been working with uh, Uniting Care Regen in Melbourne and helping them set up uh, a new withdrawal service for meth users because they were having that experience in withdrawal, people coming into inpatient withdrawal, um, causing lots of problems. Other clients were leaving because they were um, uh, aggressive, the meth clients were leaving because they were not, their needs weren't being met. And so what they started to do was use their outpatient withdrawal team and I think that um, instead of an outpatient withdrawal team, primary care might be um, useful in this setting as well. But they used their outpatient withdrawal team for the first um, week or so to start the withdrawal. And then when a bed was available, they put them into the residential um, withdrawal service and then they stayed there for a week. So we're still within the funding limits, which is one of the limiting factors. And then post um, the, the residential withdrawal, the outpatient team picked them up again and did the follow up and then they got referred into um, longer term counselling and follow up. And they've had some very good results from that. So just tweaking, using existing services, um, not costing any more, but just tweaking things around a little bit so that um, it accommodated um, what we know about meth users a little more easily. Thank you very much for listening. If you need to ask me a question after this or contact me, there's multiple social media and online ways to do that. Thank you.